Hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to introduce you to Lauren Dolly Duke, who's a writer, educator, entrepreneur, and community activist. She's taught thousands of yoga students over the last 15 years, led dozens of international retreats, and continues to push the edge between yoga, mental health, and trauma. She devotes her time to helping educate people on the anatomy of trauma and how those experiences are woven into the tapestry of our lives. Her memoir, Shithouse, was released on January 11th. Uh, please uh, help me in welcoming, not that this is a live audience, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Lauren Dolly Duke to Uncorking a Story. How are you, Lauren? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Hello, hello. all the people in the ethers out there. <laughs> Say hello to all those people who are- Hello, who are, people. <laughs> they'd like to feel loved. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say that this is a uh, quirky story is about the stories behind the story. So Lauren, please tell me where does your story begin? Yeah. I mean, I think my story probably really began when I was born, but the, um, initial impetus to actually, no, let's start here. So I had this crazy experience. I was 15 years old. This is in the book. Um, it's somewhere in the middle And my dad, he had been in prison for robbing a bank for several years. And he was there for like eight years. He got out. He lived in my basement. He called the basement the shithouse. That's why the book, there's actually way more symbolism that we can get into on the shithouse and what that means. But um, he took my sister and I, after living with us for about a year, I think it became very apparent to him. He was the drug addict and it became very apparent to him that he was not fit for fatherhood. And so he made some crazy story up that he wrote this manuscript and that this manuscript um, got picked up by a big publisher and that he got $60,000 and that he was going to take us to a car lot and we were going to pick out cars. And, and then he was, that was going to be his like going away present um, to us. And he was just going to go disappear into the world and die. This is the story that he told us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And So this actually happened. We went to the car lot. Somehow he got this money. Turns out later on, he stole some money from a friend's mother. Um, And me and my sister, I was 15 years old. She was not quite 17. And we drove off the car lot with these cars, which now it's like looking back on it. I'm like, how did anyone allow this to happen? How (laughs) This would, it's like, I don't, I don't even know that this could happen now, you know? Um, anyway, and that night, my sister and I, we drove home to our house and we were laying in our bedroom above the shit house, uh, which was the basement. And I told my sister one day, because the, the, the contents of the, the 10 years prior to this event were so crazy. And I said to her one day, I'm going to write a, write a book about this. And someone's going to make a movie about it. Like you cannot make this shit up. And so that really, I think was the first moment that I knew I was going to write this book. Of course, what I didn't know is all the other stuff that was happening inside of me as a result of all of these kind of traumatic experiences that I was going through, you know, but at the time when you're young and you don't really have the capacity to to self-reflect because you're in survival mode, you don't really think about those things. You're just trying to like get through the day and somehow keep this car and not tell my mom, (laughs) you know, because it was like the only gift I'd ever been given. Um, And, you know, not get caught and not go to jail and not die. And that was kind of the history of, um, you know, all the people in my family, jail, drugs, death. You know, I'm I'm thinking back to to my childhood and and my dad took me and my twin brother to play a lot of golf. Um, (laughs) Really different. I mean, there was no robbing of banks or, or, or cars or anything like that. So kind of a very different childhood. I have to say, I noticed something on your wrist when, when you were talking, you have a tattoo on your wrist. Yeah, I have a tattoo, which is funny because now it looks like a prison tattoo, um, which is not too dissimilar from half the people in my family, but it says love thyself. It's upside down. So I can see it. Oh no, it's actually facing you facing your direction. But the funny thing is that I got this tattoo with like a few girlfriends when I was 19 years old, when I think all of us were, were in this space of existential crisis and, um, drinking too much, partying too much, probably having way too many meaningless relationships and, and not feeling self-love. And so we went and got the tattoo as a reminder to love ourselves. And there was three of us that got it. But the funny thing is, is the next day after I got it, they, the one thing they told me, cause I was living in Southern California at this time, they said, do not go in the water right now. And the first thing I did, because it was like one of the 
the things that um, really brought me a lot of life and vitality was surfing. And I had discovered surfing kind of in my early teenage years. I went surfing. And so it kind of leaked in blood everywhere. But anyway, so that's the kind of the story behind that tattoo. Wow. Wow. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. But yeah. so, I mean, to, to say that you had um, a traumatic childhood is, is likely an understatement. Um, <laughs> how did you how did you sort of and maybe you haven't, but come to terms with that trauma. And how did you, you know, how did, how did you process it? Yeah. I mean, I have come to terms with it. That's how I wrote this book. And that's actually my work as an educator to when I, when you read in my bio to um, educate people on the anatomy of trauma, that's what I really do. That's what I use my platform for. Um, But how did I come to terms with it? Well, I um, was a mess. And as a lot of people would be who were in my situation and just full survival mode and didn't have um, caregivers who had attuned to me and influences that showed me how to mentors that showed me how to be in the world, I kind of had to learn everything on my own kept getting in trouble. Um, By the time I was out of high school, again, this, you know, existential piece, I, by the time I was like 18 or 19, I started taking a few yoga classes and, and that was the first moment of my life where I felt, um, coherent, you know, like all the pieces, me, uh, pieces of me were kind of online together at the same time integrated. Whereas what I, I normally was kind of in this state of chaos, which people who have a lot of unresolved trauma, that's what their nervous system, that's what's happening inside their body. It's like, all, there's all this displaced emotions and energy and experiences, and they're not organized. And um, so, you know, that disorganization was basically like running amok with my life. I was, and I kept repeating these you know, mistakes over and over again. And it was all the things that I could do to not tolerate my reality whether it was doing drugs, partying. And I was still at the same time to kind of, um, to uh, uh, neutralize all the bad things I was doing. I would go to yoga, right? (laughs) Which, you know, it's like a lot of people do that actually. Um, And, but, but the yoga was really like the first moment of calm in my entire life. And I couldn't articulate what was physiologically happening to me at the time. I thought it was really mystical. I thought it was, you know, so anyway, that was kind of my, um, entryway into this more self-reflective world. And the deeper and deeper I got into, um, you know, the yoga world and the meditation world and the breathing world. And, um, the more I started to self-reflect and at this period of time, also, um, I was kind of, maybe I was 26 or 27. I was really having PTSD symptoms, like really bad. And, um, and I was, I was sick, but I was, Um, I was teaching yoga at this time, but I didn't want to reveal that to people because I felt like an imposter, you know, Mm -hmm. it was like yoga was kind of helping me get through my life. It was like helping me manage what was happening inside of me, but it wasn't really healing what was happening inside of me. And I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I started therapy and that's basically the beginning, maybe that was 27. And that was really the beginning of this, um, you know, even deeper self inquiry that like, I almost needed someone else to tell me what I was going through was not okay. And that that is the reason that a body can only hold so much that a mind can only hold so much before it basically implodes. And that is what happened to me. Um, And so that was, you know, through therapy, and particularly through the writing process and the meaning making process and, and, and the investigation and you know, curiosity that writing <clears throat> offers that's, and also all the education I've done around the nervous system and trauma, that's kind of how I landed my way into a more integrated and resolved state. Yeah. It took a long time. Yeah, no, I mean, none of that change happens overnight, but I mean, just thinking about, yeah. you know, you from, from such a young age being um, sort of in survival mode, like as you enter adulthood, um, you know, that, that, if you're constantly in survival mode, that's got to impact just every aspect of your life. I mean, it's, you know, whether it's personal relationships or, or professional relationships, things that you want to do. I mean, just having your nervous system always into survival mode and and then having to kick into it whenever sort of roadblocks come in, I would imagine is it's just an exhausting way to, to live. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's the reason why, like I said before, you know, somatically, somatic means of the body, like we can only handle so much. And 
Um, and it wasn't just that it wasn't just like the things that were lingering in, the, in my body. It was all the things that I had been taught. Like I had so many, um, limiting belief systems about myself and, I was so full of shame because I had participated in some of the really ugly acts of my childhood, you know, with my family members, because that, that was survival mode. It's like you, if you can't beat them, join them. And that, you know, that was all I knew. So, um, those self-limiting beliefs and the shame is <clears throat> really what drove me to continue to repeat all of these really um, disruptive and dysfunctional behaviors and patterns over and over and over again. It affected the jobs that I would take. It like, I I've just done, I mean, so many things that I just can't, I don't even want to talk about because I, that's how I felt about myself. It was all a reflection of how I felt about myself and the, how I felt about myself was a reflection of what I had been taught. It was a social construct. It was all bullshit. And that was one thing that I like, Un, untethered while I was writing this book is that, oh my God, everything that I have learned is basically bullshit and that I can be anything I want. But of course, bridging the gap between everything that you've learned and all these things that you want to be, that's the work, right? Yeah. That's the work to be able to get from this place to this place. And, um, you know, that was, that was, that's, that's hard. It's like basically, um, choosing new habits, new behaviors, new, belief systems that don't feel true and trying to live them out every single day over and over again, reinforcing them to yourself until they become true. It's like fake until you make it. Yeah. That's basically what I did my whole life. But now I am actually myself, which is great. <laughs> and I feel like some people, they, I feel really lucky. I am 39 years old. I'm very clear on who I am. I understand what I've been through. I forgive myself and my family members. And now I get my whole life. Whereas I like look at my mother and my mom is just so full of like anger and rage and resentment because she blames everyone else for all of her problems because she's not interested in what writing and, you know, contemplative practice offers, which is self-reflection and self-examination and self-accountability, you know, and being able to see your story from a more holistic perspective. So, I mean, you spent so much of your life, kind of your early part of your life, jumping on and off the crazy train, which is what I like to, what I like to call it. Um, then like through, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You and Ozzy Osbourne can, can, uh, <laughs> oh, maybe that his yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just one of his bigger songs, but, but, you know, you're on the crazy train. Um, then you decide to jump off. You, you know, you spend some time you doing yoga, doing therapy. I'm curious as to the role writing played, um, in, in your healing process and the, and the role it currently plays right now was, was this book your first attempt at writing something for others to read or, or had you sort of you know, published uh, beforehand? Yeah. So, you know, the funny thing is, and I just told my husband this the other day, when I was coming out of high school, um, like I was in all the, um, the, the classes for the juvenile delinquents, you know, that was like me, but somehow I may, I was always in honors English or excelled English. Like that was my strong suit is storytelling and writing, um, when I graduated high school, I got this, like no one had ever gone to college and in, in, in my family and, and no one even knew how to help someone take the steps to get there. And somehow someone had told me about this like writing contest. And I wrote this personal essay. Don't remember what it's about. And I got $5,000 to go to college. I won this contest and, um, $5,000 was like a lot of money, you know? So I had some scholarship money. And, um, and so that was kind of like, I would say high school was the beginning where that was like the first time someone reinforced that I was good at something besides I was a pretty good soccer player, but that's because I was very violent. So, you know, I was taking out all my like <laughs> on the soccer field. Um, but yeah, so, so really, you know, it kind of started in high school and, um, and then I started college as a journalism major. So I was doing a lot of writing, but that's so, that kind of writing is so different than creative writing or memoir writing, you know, or narrative nonfiction writing. That was more like, um, we had to follow a recipe, you know? And I was never good at that. Like yeah. I didn't grow up following recipes. I grew up learning how to 
fucking break the law. That was like, you know, which I actually think is a really amazing quality now because my brain doesn't work the way that other people's work. But um, yeah, so I was, I was a journalism major. Then I like kind of dropped out of school, went off, did all the things that, that I needed to do to really support myself um, and, and manage my life kind of like float through rather than get my feet on the ground and really like be a uh, embodied conscious human in my life. Um, and then I, yeah, I had a few things that I got published, a few personal essays and like, I always knew I was kind of a good writer, but so then when this happened, it was like 2016 and I just got to a point where, um, this is when my PTSD symptoms were still pretty bad. And I was just like, I can't hold in what is happening to me anymore. And for me, the, um, outlet was exercise or writing. And I was already doing all of the ex trying to exercise it all away. That wasn't working. So I just like basically verbal diarrhea onto the page. And I wrote, um, starting in January of 2016 or 15, I don't even know what year it was, but, um, I kind of just like stream of consciousness, verbal diarrhea onto the page. And that lasted like six months. And I wrote, 350 pages or something. And then I was like, oh my God, I just wrote a book. Like, I'm going to go publish this. Here, here we go. And he says, someone told me, oh, someone told me about this writing workshop um, with David Ulin, who was the LA Times book review editor at the time. And this other woman, Amy Wallen, she was a literature professor at UCSD and an editor. And, um, and so I entered that manuscript into this, um, this writing workshop and they took 10 people and I went in and everyone in there was a published author except for me. And so I was kind of like, or they were like a, an English teacher. And here I was, I was like, <laughs> you know, just like, I don't even know what I'm doing here, but like, I just, I wrote this book. It's a real book, you know? And, um, after the workshop, they basically told me like, look, you have the best story. You have the thing that these other people who are way overtrained, they don't have it. You have a voice and you have a story to tell, but what you don't have is you don't understand the recipe. You don't mm -hmm. understand the craft. And we're going to teach you if you want, we will teach you how to, um, you know, we'll teach you the art and craft of writing. And so right then, of course, that was like, a, that was, a, you know, I had a little bit of a bruised ego after that, but that was really when I started, um, to, you know, work on my writing and, and I work with an editor and I worked with Amy, the, I worked with so many, right. I mean, editors, teachers, coaches, like dozens and dozens over the last several years, but like they, they taught me this process. So like, I always had this story inside of me, but um, I had, it was like a recipe out of order, you know? And as soon as I learned, like, I almost wish I would have learned the craft before I even started, but that's not what happened because it would have like, um, it would have been much more expedited, you know? And I think I could have seen it from, um, those deeper lenses, the way that I did later on when I had some support and some help and someone asking me the right questions, like, this is what you need to be asking yourself, because that's really like writing is a form of, of resistance in a big way, because it's asking you to do everything that kind of mainstream culture is asking you not to do. Like writing is asking you to self-reflect, to, you know, contemplate, to examine not just yourself, but the setting, the time, the characters, the character's life for character development. And that was when I, um, when I was able to see my story from a much more holistic perspective, for me, that was when I uncorked myself. Like that was when I really started to do some real healing because I could see the nature of the things that I went through, how they built me and how I was continuing to play those things out and how my parents' belief systems were also learned and that they were passing them on to me, right? So I learned all of these kind of false belief systems. And when I was able to see that, I was so much more compassionate for all the choices that I had made. And I was also very compassionate and forgiving to my family members. Like I was like, oh my God, everyone is just repeating the same shit. They have been learned without critically thinking about how does this affect people? Is this true? Is this real? But almost like 
checking off boxes and just being in survival mode, not really living a life. So (laughs) no, that was great. But in, first of all, I just want to say extra points for using the term uncorked. So that was good. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, if, you know, your, your family members, um, have any of them read the book and what, if so, what have their reactions been? Yeah. Um, well, it's fascinating too, because today what's today, today is the 25th. That means exactly two weeks ago, my book came out into the world. And, um, a lot of people that know my family have read the book and I'm getting so much interesting feedback. Um, and my sister has read the book and my cousin has read the book. Like basically everyone's read the book, but my mom, my mom could have read the book, but you'll just never know. And I'll probably never know because, um, I have learned like one of the things that I learned through the writing process is how much pain my own mom is in. And in, if she was going to acknowledge the things that happened and the way she raised her children and the things that happened to her children, I think it would be unbearable for her. So her self-protective protective mechanism is denial. I mean, mm-hmm. that is what she, <clears throat> that is what helps. That's her own survival mode um, quality. And so even um, she doesn't acknowledge it. Then the other day I said, uh, hey, do you want to talk about the book? And she's like, no, no. And we just carry on. So I have learned that I, the, one of the reasons why we suffer is because we expect other people to meet us where we're at rather than I think a more healthy perspective and outlet would be to meet people where they're at. And that's where my mom is. And because of my own writing process and self-reflective um, process, I'm able to see that in her and I'm really compassionate to her. Um, my sister, that was really hard. Um, I cut my sister basically out of the book because my editor was like, she's like a ghost character. She's not, she's like kind of there, but she's not really there. So you need to decide either cut her out and like barely make her a character at all or add her in and really fill out her character. And at this time, you know, my sister and I, we, because we didn't have very good caregivers, we really learned to um, compete for attention. And so we never got along, you know, we've always had a really like historically, we've had a very volatile relationship. And for some reason, um, it's been really hard to find common ground with her. And she told me that if I used anyone's names or like, she basically threatened to sue me. And so I changed all the, I basically took her out. I changed everybody's names. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that at some point in the last year, she asked me if she could read the book. And this was like before the book was actually published. And that um, process of her reading the book, she understood me so much more. And for the first time, we actually have a relationship. Like she, we did a, um, a, a Zoom launch since my, um, my book launch got canceled. I was doing this like big concert, but because of um, COVID, I had COVID, all the musicians had COVID. <laughs> we had to cancel it. <clears throat> and she helped me. She helps people launch things like online. And she produced my whole launch and, um, and basically was like the speaker of it. And, and that was really big. You know, I think, um, she recognized the book was about me that obviously there's so many, it involves all these other characters. Um, but, but really it wasn't about defaming anyone in my family. It was about telling my story um, and, and sharing the lessons that I've learned that have helped me kind of find my way back to wholeness and fullness and sharing those with other people. And she's like a women's coach. And I think like recognizing that she was just like, I can't shut this person down. I would be a total hypocrite because this yeah. is what I teach people to do. You know, um, a lot of the people who've read it, I think that, um, the people who know, know my family and our family history, because so many people from my hometown have read the book. I feel like they've been the biggest supporters of the book so far because everyone is kind of like, I lived in like small town USA and oftentimes in small town USA, no one ever goes off and publishes a book. You know, people just kind of stay in small town USA. And so I think a lot of people find it so fascinating that I wrote a book and they're looking for clues to themselves. Like they're looking for clues to their own existence because I'm not just um, 
I'm not just myself in this book. Like I'm a character that is an archetype that re represents all the things that people go through growing up in a small town, you know? And so I think um, people are enjoying it. People that knew my family, I think it's painful for them, you know, mostly to think about all the times that they could have intervened that they didn't. Um, and it's making people reflect on their own lives and particularly their relationship with their parents. And that was my main mission. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you had access to, to Marty McFly's DeLorean, right. And, and you could go back in time. Um, I know this is a tricky one, but, but would you take that opportunity to, to change how you were raised? No, no. I mean, I do want to go in Marty McFly's DeLorean. So <laughs> I would get in it and like travel around and just kind of see what else is out there. So I could have some reference points and some perspective that my life wasn't the only absolute way to live, that there was something else. But I think that because I have been through really crazy shit that for most people, like I have some friends that have just lived in a bubble their whole life. And they're like, I can't even read this book because the first half of it is like, it's fucking heavy. It's like stuff that people go through that, that someone who's living in a bubble finds it really hard to relate to that suffering or even read it, you know? And I don't want to be, I can hold anything for anyone. And I think that's what makes me a good friend and a good teacher because someone could tell me anything or I could examine or see something happening in the world. And like, I can handle it because I've been through things and I know how to, no matter what kind of shit comes at me, like I know how to get up off the ground and keep going. And I think that if I hadn't been through all the things that I have been through, I wouldn't be as badass as I am right now at 39 years old. Like I started my first business at 24 years old, a brick and mortar yoga studio. Um, I've written a book. I'm working now on my second book and I'm pretty proud of who I've become. And I know so many people, particular, no, all people, but, but women as well, because there are all people um, who you know, they're, they, they find it really hard to believe in themselves and to go out there and take up space and do the things they want. And they're unexpressed, you know? And I think that's because it's hard for people, you know, people who haven't been through things, sorry about that, um, find it hard to do things, you know, like I can do hard things. And that is what, that's like Glennon Doyle's whole thing. But I think that that's kind of what everyone needs. Like that's the human experience. Like the Buddha says life is suffering. That is real. We have to acknowledge that things are going to be hard and that part of being human is that we can do them and we can get through them. And that's why the book really is a book of, of hope and resilience because sure it starts off like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then all of a sudden, not in the middle, unfortunately, there was a lot of rising action <laughs> in this book, but all of a sudden there's a lifeline, Psh, you know, there's some self-reflection and I start slowly kind of crawling my way out of this, you know, hole of suffering. Um, and that's what I really want people to see It's like, you can turn things around and if I can do it, you can do it. But one of the things you got to do is you have to be willing to look at yourself and you have to be willing to holistically examine other people as well and recognize they're just doing the best they can, even though maybe their resources are shitty. And uh, with, with that pull on the Topo Chico, um, which is my favorite, by the way. I oh my that. God, because it is this thing I could, it could be corked, uncorked. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> for like a week and it would still be effervescent. <laughs> I know. So, it's, it's I'm not sure that's good, but. It, probably not. Um, and we don't get it nearly as many places in Connecticut as, as you can in California. But um, uh, but with that, I want to move into uh, sort of a segment I call the hot seat. So this is just, uh, um, you know, letting your gut answer these questions. Uh, no right or wrong answers. Uh, first one up, what was your favorite TV show as a kid? Say by the bell. Saved by the Bell. Oh my gosh! So that was um, Zach Zach Morris, right? Zach Morris, Kelly Kapowski, Kapowski, Kelly Kapowski. Yeah, Kelly Kapowski, who later went on to nine hundred two one zero fame. In their later years. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. And who was the one that did Showgirls, uh, which was an abysmal movie? <laughs> and you know what? I just didn't even like her character. So. Oh. 
But Elizabeth I, Berkley, I, Elizabeth Berkley, Elizabeth Berkley. That show also fucked me up because that show created this kind of paragon of girlhood that I was not a part of. And it made me feel so alienated, but yet I needed to watch it. Right. That's a right. whole other conversation. <laughs> and, and and just we should take a moment to just, you know, to, to reflect on poor Dustin Diamond, you know, Screech, who, who passed away uh, this past year. What? I did not know that. Yes, he did. Yes, I mean, his career did not go in a great direction after yeah. Saved by the Bell. Um, mm -hmm. All right, next up. How do you feel when you're staring at a blank piece of paper? Um, how do I feel when I... Well, I don't stare at a blank piece of paper because I write on a computer. But if I'm staring, uh, it's almost like the world is my oyster. It doesn't like I don't... It's not anxiety inducing for me. Interesting. Especially, and, yeah. No, go ahead. Well, I don't feel pressure to like so many people right now are like, what are you working on now? Or, uh, you know, at my launch and also with my publicist, it's like you have everyone's attention right now. What do you want to funnel them into? I'm like, I'm not trying to sell anyone. Any, I, I, I'm literally just trying to sell people on themselves, on doing their own personal reflective work, because the more people are kind of mentally, physically, spiritually, spiritually well, the better we're off in this world, you know? And that is really like my big message. But so I don't have um, lots of people like, what are you doing right now? What are you working on now? And I mean, really until yesterday, I wasn't working on anything. So I've just been looking at a blank piece of paper and kind of enjoying the, um, the, the art of doing nothing, which is also another way of resisting the attention economy right now. Yeah. I mean, do you feel any pressure for book number two? Mm -hmm. I don't feel, I feel social pressure, but I don't feel um, personal pr pressure. Uh, I know that it's going to come to me and I know that um, it is coming to me, but it's like a it's like solving a riddle, you know, it's like puzzle pieces. And it was just like this process that of, of shit house that took seven years. It couldn't have moved faster than that because I had to really deeply understand all the different parts of the story before I could put, solve the puzzle. And that's why it took so long. Like, by the way, I did not write this book in chronological order. Like, I think I wrote, um, like the first and second story, like, six years ago or something like that, you know? So it's all, everything is, and then like, it's just, I just wrote everything at different times, but I'm, I'm excited about book number two because I think it is going to be really relevant. Um, and also when anyone's like, what are you working on now? I'm just kind of like, why don't you fuck off and chill? That's kind of like, I let me chill. And I feel like that's also kind of what's wrong with our culture is we're so like production oriented. Like I just wrote a book. Like, can I have a moment without needing to move on to the next thing? Right. Right. It's like, that's what the suits want you to do. Right. They want you to. Exactly. <laughs> I've never worn a suit in my whole life. Like not going to adhere to whatever the construct is, you know? Yeah. Um, so over those, you know, seven, eight years of writing this book, what, what lesson about writing, uh, or publishing, did you learn the hard way? Do you felt like you learned the hard way? I learned every lesson the hard way. <laughs> okay. That's my history too. Um, I, you know, with, with, um, with publishing, I, uh, I didn't know anything about it and I, now I feel like I've kind of got it dialed for, you know, the next book, but I thought that, um, the writing process, I wanted it to move much faster. I wanted it to be done. I wanted to go from having this idea to having a book published. I wanted to skip all the parts in the middle that are hard. And that is also why most people have a book in them. They talk about writing it for seven years they want to be finished, they're frustrated, and they never actually finish it, you know? But the reality is like, things take the time they take. And you're basically like writing a book is, it is about the long haul, it's a marathon, you know? It is not a sprint. And um, I think releasing your um, self-constructed narratives around what it's going to be like and just letting it be what it is, is great advice. Also, digging, like really being willing to 
look at your story from every angle. And it's almost like I said this before, I felt like an archaeologist on a dig, you know, it was just like digging, 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 trying to figure out like, we, we think at the beginning that people are like, oh, well, what's the book about? Oh, it's about this and this and this. Like, no, you discover what the book is about. That is what happens. Um, with publishing, it was kind of the same thing. I just wanted it to be really easy. And I started querying in, um, in I, I wouldn't, you know what I wouldn't do? I wouldn't try to query literary agents at the beginning of a pandemic right after um, the Black Lives Matters movement and being a white girl writing a book on trauma. That, that's what I would not do. I would wait, you know, I would look at what is happening in the times um, and what's relevant. And I mean, sure, you can like skip over that and just start querying agents. Uh, but I think I really started at the wrong time and that made it really hard for me. You know, I think if I would have waited, um, I think if I would have just kind of, um, I don't want to say perfected, but really like perfected the manuscript a little bit more. And again, extracted my timeline from this bit, it would have been much easier, you know, yeah. get it copy edited, get it like do all the things that you could possibly do for this to get this manuscript in the best shape ever for people to see it rather than being so, you know, angsty to do it. Yeah. I mean, the, the querying process is, is humbling to say the least. Um, yeah. You know, you have to have some thick skin going, going through that. Um, and if you don't, you're fucked because <laughs> when you're getting rejections every single day, like you can't take it personal. It's almost like it is so subjective. Like you're looking for someone who can advocate for this and you want the right person. And not everyone likes spicy food. And just because someone sends your manuscript back and they're, they reject it, it doesn't mean overall that it sucks. It means it's not right for that person. And you have to know that and understand that. Um, otherwise, it's literally going to like completely erode and dismantle your sense of self <laughs> in a sense. Um, well, this is a good segue into question number four, which is what's the, the best piece of advice you would give to an aspiring author? Um, there's no better time than now. Just start writing. Because I think what people do is they, um, well, I need to do this first, or I need to do this workshop first, or I need to do this because there's a piece of imposter syndrome because it's something new. You know, there's, you've never done it before. Um, I should, I need to take this class or no, just start because literally the first draft, you're just telling yourself the story anyway. Right now is the time. So now that, um, it's out there and, um, you've kind of gone through that, that journey, the process, you found the age and you got published. How do you, or have you celebrated your success? Well, I have had COVID, <laughs> so um, you know, one of the things that my sister really did um, during my online book launch, she was like, for her, it was really about celebrating me. And um, I love that. I can see that's why she's also really successful is because she makes people feel really seen. Um, and it was funny because during the uh, book launch, she was like, it really was basically a celebration and a party of, you know, this accomplishment. Um, but she was like, okay, people praise her, like, which was very uncomfortable. I was like, oh my God. But so that is one thing I did. I indulged this, um, this online launch with lots of people and like, you know, took people's reflections and it's nice to, to hear that, you know, so many people had such deep insight. Um, that means that, what I wanted to be translated, I translated. That feels good. Um, and at some point, I am chilling. I'm doing a lot of resting. I mean, also, I've had COVID. Um, but I haven't really done anything in person yet. All I wanted to do on my book launch day, which was the, I mean, I was coming down with it a little before, but I was like feeling really sick that day. All I wanted to do was like go have margaritas with friends. So at some point, soon, I'm going to have margaritas with friends, which I know it's like, that might not seem like a big deal. Um, but for me, I'm not like, I know what I am. I know what I've achieved. 
I acknowledge myself and I don't really, and I know where this book is going to go. Just watch. I know by the end of the year, it's go, there's going to be way more conversations around the book. Um, and yeah, I just like, I, I'm acknowledging myself by just giving myself this time to rest and I don't need some like big party or anything, just some margaritas with friends. I will, uh, I will join you virtually with a, for a margarita. How's that sound? Yes. <laughs> uh, one of my faves. Um, what are you capable of doing now that you weren't able to do before writing this book? Um, well, I'm capable of writing a book. <laughs> Check that box. Um, and you know, more than, more than before, I know how capable I am, you know, like I finished something that most people dream about doing that they don't really ever finish. That means that I can do all the hard things. I can get over ops, all the obstacles to this place of, um, of completion. And it makes me feel like, um, I feel really empowered and I recognize that I am capable of whatever I want. And that is the opposite state of a traumatized state because a traumatized state is a disempowered state. And I feel so empowered, especially, you know, everything I've been through to get to here, but then also really being willing to look at all the hard pieces of my life and still forgive everyone. Like that is, and forgive myself you know, and that is, that's some really deep work. And I honestly, if I never do anything for the rest of my life, I think I've done life good enough. And last question of the hot seat is um, <laughs> thinking about your younger self, you know, your, your younger self, who's getting that car. Um, yep. What words of advice, if, if you could write this, is, I call this my Brad Paisley letter to me question, right? So, you know, if Love you could write a letter, question. if you could write a letter to your younger self and, and mail it and, and, and she could read it, what are some words of advice you would tell your younger self? Yeah, well, um, gosh, I was telling my younger self this yesterday. I was having a conversation with my assistant. She's 25 years old and she's feeling very um, defeated by all that she's not doing, you know, because she's really wrapped up again in that production mindset. She's having her own existential crisis. And I, I was sharing with her, it's all bullshit. All of it is bullshit all the ideas and narratives about what we're supposed to do. And it needs to look like this and it needs to look like this. And it's, it's bullshit. And that you can be anything you want. And that is like, when I was a kid, I wish I had someone reiterating and reinforcing that mindset to me rather than, well, this is just how things are. And like, I remember, you know, my mom, she would go to work and she was a barber. She didn't, you know, complain about it too much, but she's like, no one likes their job. And then they just come home and drink. And this is just how it is. Like, this is what everybody does. And they get fat. And it's like, she just like her, her belief systems were so binary. They were so black and white. And I believed it all. I believed it as if it was the only absolute biggest truth of the world. And what I realized later on, and especially through writing this book, all of our belief systems, everything we learn is socially constructed. It's bullshit. When you can start to see that, oh my God, I've learned all this stuff that has built me, but it doesn't have to become me. If we've built it, we could tear it down too and build whatever we want. And um, I know that again, that's hard because that means you're over here with these ideas. You kind of want to get over here, but you don't know how to get there. And so you have to bridge that gap, you know, and that means you really have to go through life and basically fake till you make it. <laughs> Don't believe the bullshit. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, the book is out, uh, came out on January 11th. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening in who are saying to themselves, you know, I want to learn more about that story. I want to learn more about her life. Where can people go to pick up Shithouse? Yeah. So um, it is available through all major retailers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, um, blah, blah, blah. You can support those big corporate businesses, which actually control all the algorithms for why re small retailers even pick the book up. They control the New York Times, the bestsellers list. It's good for an author, but it doesn't make the author the most amount of money, you know, the artist the most amount of money for 
whatever it is. I mean, you don't really like write a book to get rich anyway. <laughs> you know, you're not making shit. Don't tell anybody the secrets. Gosh, yeah. Dirty seriously. little secrets of publishing and writing. Jeez, jeez. Um, but a lot of uh, small, like independent bookstores are carrying the book. And one of the things that you can do that I love that people have been doing is they have been going to their local bookstore and they're asking that store to order the book for them. And a few of these smaller retailers have actually picked the book up because once that someone orders it, they see that there's interest. So it actually really does benefit the um, the reader, the writer, and the bookstore. Yeah. And then also... Um, my people can look me up on Instagram. My Instagram is um, Dolly Duke 83, D O L L I E D U K E. 83 is the year I was born. Some people are like, what's 83? It's, I was born in 19, 1983. Um, but yeah, there's, you can find out more about me there. I do a lot of like uh, online talks and a lot of my educational stuff is on there. And I always post like if I'm teaching or because I teach yoga um, on Sundays, but people can also like in the park here in Ojai, but I also Zoom it. And my yoga class really is a uh, basically like a mini workshop on how your nervous system works. And trauma is actually just nervous system dysfunction. So that I use yoga as a platform to basically educate people on how their bodies work so they can resolve their own nervous system dysfunction, which is really trauma resolution. Very cool. Actually, I, I did think of one final question for you. Yeah. Um, what happened to that car? Oh, Yeah. Um, well, so what happened, you're talking about the car that my dad bought me. That's right. Yeah. So the deal was my dad said, um, I'm going to buy you guys these cars, but you can never tell your mom, you have to hide them. You have to park them underneath the heritage Oak, a block over. So we did, we, we parked them underneath the heritage Oak tree. That was the deal. Dad disappeared, got caught in Mexico, smuggling drugs. That's the story on that. Um, and then the cars, about three weeks later, I was working at the chart house and all of a sudden I see these men, these big, like five big men coming in suits and they repossess the cars. Um, my sister was actually, no, she wasn't there. She was working at the chart house at the time as well. Um, but they repossessed my car in front of everyone, basically made this whole ordeal that I was in on it with my dad and that they're going to turn me in to the police. Um, they took the car away. I was totally humiliated. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's what happened to the car. It got repossessed by a bunch of giant gorillas. Wow. <laughs> well, not the story that's I anticipated, fun. but I'm not surprised. Yep. That um, was fun. And that <laughs> was 15. I was 15 handling that. Like, it's like, I couldn't process looking back on it now. I'm like, God, it makes so much sense that I ended up like with PTSD and not even able to like drive a car. Yeah, of course, because your body can only handle so much. And so. Anyway, I'm glad it all kind of came out and, and, um, and I was able to look at everything and kind of reintegrate and reorganize my life. All right. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me and share your story with the audience. I'll remind them that Shithouse is available now. You can go to your local bookstores and ask them to order it for you if they don't have it in stock. Lauren, all the best with the book. Thank you. 